Here is everything you need to know about Brian Koberger and the four University of Idaho students that he stabbed on November 13th of 2022. These are the four beautiful souls that were taken that night. This is Zanna. Zanna was dating Ethan and Ethan was staying over at their home that night. And this is Madison and Kaylee and Madison and Kaylee were best friends. Ethan and Zanna were at a party on campus that night. They arrived home around 1.45 a.m. Madison and Kaylee were also out that night. They were at a downtown sports bar called The Corner Club and they left there around 1.30 a.m. The two stopped at a food truck at 1.41 a.m. to order something to eat and the food truck happened to be live streaming on a Twitch channel. So there's actual video footage of the two girls waiting for their food. Once they got their food, they ended up getting a drive home with someone. Once the four were at home, the police were able to put together a bit of a timeline based on events happening on their phone. For instance, we know that Kaylee was trying to call her ex-boyfriend between 2.44 a.m. and 2.52 a.m. And we know that Xana actually ordered DoorDash at 4 a.m. This is the home where everything took place that night. There were actually five university students renting this home. There were six people, however, in the home that night as Ethan, Xana's boyfriend, was sleeping over. It was initially believed that the two other roommates in the home must have been sleeping on the first floor and had slept in. But after affidavits and things were released, we now know that one roommate was sleeping on the first floor and had slept through it. But the second roommate was actually on the second floor, the same floor that Ethan and Zana were sleeping on. Madison and Kaylee were on the third floor. The roommate sleeping on the second floor was actually able to give police quite a bit of information from that evening. She actually woke up a few times. The first time she thought she heard Zana and her dog. The second time she woke up, she heard someone say, there's someone here. She thought it might have been Zana, but police believe it could have been Ethan because according to phone records, Zana was actually on her phone on TikTok at about 4.12 a.m. The roommate also had opened her door a few times. The first time she opened her door, she heard someone crying. The second time she heard the door, she heard a male voice say, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Around this time at 4.17 a.m., security cameras around the home actually picked up whimpering, a loud thud, and heard a dog barking incessantly. The roommate then opened the door for the third time and witnessed a figure dressed all in black, including a black face mask that covered their mouth and nose coming down the hall. She said she froze in fear initially and then immediately went into her room and locked herself in. The 911 call wasn't made until the next day around lunchtime. It was actually 11.58 a.m. when one of the roommates called. They said they were calling for an unconscious roommate, so they ended up contacting some of their other friends to come over to the home as they were very concerned. Once the police arrived there, it was evident they were not unconscious and all four victims were reported deceased at that time. Police were able to obtain surveillance footage from around the home from that night and they ended up seeing a white Elantra in the area numerous times. It was actually seen three times driving by the home and in that area between 3.29 a.m. and 4.04 a.m. It was then seen again for a fourth time at 4.20 a.m. speeding away from the area. Police were eventually able to trace that vehicle back to this man seen in the vehicle with his father. This is Brian Koberger. At 9 a.m. the next morning after the murders, this vehicle was seen in the area again driving past the home. They ended up getting his cell phone records and found out that his phone was also there at 9 a.m. that morning. However, the night before, from 2.47 a.m. until 4.48 a.m., his phone was turned off. They were also able to uncover that his phone had actually pinged near the home 12 times prior to November 13th when the incident happened. Every time his phone had pinged near their home, it was always very late in the evening or early in the morning. They also found out that he was following three of the victims on Instagram. Two weeks before the killings, he had also reached out to one of the victims, trying to contact them in their DMs on Instagram. It does not appear that they received the message, however, they were in the requested folder. Police said that he didn't seem frustrated or anything, but that he was repeatedly messaging, asking how they were and what they were up to. Brian Koberger lived just eight miles from this home. He was going to Washington State University trying to get his PhD in criminology. He also had his bachelor's degree in psychology and his master's degree in criminal justice. Lots of people have been interviewed now about Brian Koberger's past. Some say that he was extremely bullied when he was younger because of his weight. Others have come forward to say that he was the bully and bullied them. 
One interview in particular was from a bar owner of the Seven Sirens Brewing Company. He said that they have a scanning system for ID cards when you come in and they can write notes on your account. He says that there were numerous complaints from female employees as well as patrons that he would come in, sit and stare at the women and then go up and ask inappropriate questions like, are you here alone and where do you live? The owner says that he eventually approached Koberger one night when he came in, told him that all of this needed to stop, and Koberger in response said that it wasn't him and he must have him confused with someone else. The owner claims that he immediately left the bar and never returned. Police wanted to arrest Koberger but didn't feel they had enough evidence yet, so they put a surveillance team on him while he was staying at his parents' home in Pennsylvania. Police said they ended up watching him clean the inside and outside of his vehicle with a fine tooth comb. They said that he did not miss an inch when cleaning that car. They also witnessed him wearing surgical gloves and carrying garbage out from his parents' home and putting it into the neighbor's garbage bins. Of course, the police collected all of this and it's being analyzed. Police ended up using genetic genealogy to test the trash that they had found, and they ended up getting Kohlberger's father's DNA from that and were able to make a match with Kohlberger. When they arrested Kohlberger in his parents' home, he was found taking Ziploc baggies to put trash in them and again was wearing surgical gloves. No murder weapon had been recovered from the scene, but they did find a sheath for a knife that had Kohlberger's DNA on it. When they searched his family's home, they ended up removing several items, including a knife, a Glock handgun with three empty magazines. They also ended up finding a black face mask, gloves, and a hat. Kohlberger's parents released a statement on January 2nd of 2023. They expressed their extreme condolences to the victim's families, but they also stated that they would be supporting their son as they did not believe he was guilty, nor is he admitting any guilt. Kohlberger is now being charged with four counts of murder and one charge of felony burglary. He waived his right to a speedy trial and he also did not fight the extradition that police wanted to bring him from Pennsylvania to Idaho. Police said when they took him from Pennsylvania to Idaho that he didn't say much, but it seemed that he was extremely nervous and at times he would talk to himself telling him everything's going to be okay. It was announced this past June that they are going to be seeking the death penalty in this case. We don't know when the trial is going to start because, again, he has waived his right to a speedy trial, but they are thinking it's going to be in 2024. His lawyers actually put in a motion for there to be no cameras or video streaming in the courtroom, and there's been a happy medium, I guess, made. The judge has now ruled that there will be no news or media coverage allowed in the room, no cell phones or anything like that but that the court will be live streaming it. And I will be posting, of course, the link where you can watch that as soon as it comes up. So make sure to hit follow. This past February, the owners of this home that the four students rented donated this home to the university and the university has announced that it will be demolished.